Hi, I'm Phil Cook, and today is going to be a great episode because I'm interviewing Jim Kruger. Now, Jim is a very, very well-known comic book writer. He's written for Marvel. He's written for DC. He's written for many of the other major comic book brands. He's also a filmmaker and a novelist. And you'll be amazed at the sheer number of comics he's created in written. It's going to be a fantastic interview, so you do not want to miss this. So stay tuned. Jim Kruger, it's incredibly exciting to have you on the show today. I uh, We've been trying to t- pull this off for a long time. We finally got it going, and I'm just really, really thrilled you're here. You're, you, by the way, you're the first comic book writer we've ever had on the podcast. So there you go. You're a first. Awesome. So It's, it's upwards from here. <laughs> Well, I have to say, you're a comic book writer, you're also a filmmaker, a novelist, you're doing a lot of creative stuff out there, um, and you all start, and you started everything in Milwaukee, is that right? I did, I did. Milwaukee is where I grew up. Milwaukee is where my dad used to take me on tow jobs and get me my first comic books because I'd hold the rag for him. That was my, <laughs> that was my job. You stand here, hold the rag, give it to me when, when I'm, when my hands are dirty, and that's what I would do, but but he would give me Jack Kirby comics. He would give me Spider-Man. Wow. He would give me, you know, everything and tell me stories about how his father, when he was sick, would bring him a stack of comic books. And that. so there's kind of a legacy. There's even a rosebud mentality that, you know, if I get really rich one day and stuff yep. like that, my dying words will be Spider-Man or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I Growing up, I had an incredible affinity for comic books. I had a collection that was taller than, than I was, and I made the mistake when I was about 12. But you were little. Uh, when I was little, I made the mis- <laughs> Well, yeah, I was. Um, but I made the mistake of loaning them to a guy that lived two doors down from me, Ricky Baker. I'm going to say this if he's listening. Uh, and he stole them. He stole my comic books, the entire collection. He never returned them. Uh, went to his house and he said I never gave them to him. And his dad came to the door and got real indignant. And to this day, I've never forgiven Ricky Baker for that. Swiped. I mean, I had a ton of comic books. Loved them. So anyway, I'm totally in your your vibe. So, so there, there's also an apocryphal story about a trip to Disney World that kind of got you into this whole thing. What, what was that? Go- what was that about? Yeah, well, well, because my dad had had his own business and was a mechanic and had all these guys working for him when he wasn't taking me on tow jobs. My mom started putting the pressure on him to do a family vacation, uh. and so we um, we got on a train. It was a, a train like from Milwaukee to Chicago, and then a sleeper unit because. Trains were so much cheaper in those days, all the way to Florida. Yeah. And halfway down, there was a there was a hurricane that hit Florida. And my mom, you know, who never wants us to suffer, never wanted her children to suffer, even to this day, would made up things like, well, maybe there's a lot you can do inside of Disney World. It's not gonna matter. And my dad, who had been kind of in the military, he's he's kind of he doesn't quite tell all the stories related to this. He said, well, when I was in the military in Florida, those storms could start and stop right away. But meanwhile, it's a hurricane. So (laughs) the day has come, the train has gotten there. And there's another little comic related thing that I'll say afterward, but we've gotten there and we're all in, you know, our yellow ponchos ready to go into Disney world. We go by the gate and, you know, there's, because I'm a Disney nut, there's, um, There's the train that goes around at Disney World. You have to go underneath and um, you have to go like through a tunnel. And that's where they have all the, all the like lockers, all the different places you put stuff or whatever. So anyhow, between entering that, what I call a tunnel and coming out on the other side of Main Street, the hurricane broke, like it stopped. So I went in and storm in the darkness and like, you know, what? It's not even a, maybe it's a half a block, but maybe we put stuff in a locker so it took longer or whatever. But coming out on the other side, and you had like these angelic beams of light streaming through clouds with puddles that reflected the castle and Main Street. And I was like, what? And, and my dad looked down at me and maybe his, said his greatest words ever. He said, now you know why they call it the Magic Kingdom. 
<laughs> I was screwed up from there. I was like, I was just messed up from there. From that point on, somehow I didn't even know at the time I was going to be a storyteller. Somehow the ideas of going from storms into yeah. bigger darkness into something that was even magical or unbelievable, somehow that got into my DNA. Um, and, you know, I didn't know because I would have been six at this time. I didn't know that my first form of storytelling would be to be a chronic liar to get out of doing homework in grade school. But you know what? It worked. I'm, I'm not judging myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you you got you you really started in, in the advertising world, right? Is that how you got your career going? I did. I did. I started in the advertising world because I was um, good at coming up with funny puns and sayings and stuff like that. I really didn't understand business. So my first couple advertising jobs would be, I, they would put me on the creative stuff yeah. that no one was paying for, but it was part of being part of the industry and stuff like that. But I won some Addy Awards and, you know, I kind of had heard that you need to really be true or one way to always kind of stay on point is, is to be true to what those dreams were when you were when you were a child what those those things that were your yep. first loves those things that were your first hungers so i went back to comic books i was like you know what i've got i've got a degree in advertising and copywriting and marketing and so i did a campaign for myself um to marvel comics in new york city and it was again it was really fun campaign you know one of it would be they were a set of cards that that had a tease on the front of the card and then opened up for the joke and then my name and you know probably probably the best one of it was and this was all true of course was um you know in the last six months i found homeless people living in my basement witnessed a gang beating and have been held at gunpoint and then it opened up and said i think i'm ready for new york Jim Cooker copywriter. And it was like that. And brilliant. And, and then I sent my portfolio and they loved the portfolio and they loved all the jokes. And they're like, well, our, our industry is changing and, you know, our department's probably growing. So we, you know, maybe three, six months, you know, we can, you can, and, and I was like, well, don't send back my portfolio. How about if I come and pick it up there and then you can meet me now. And when there's a chance, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I yeah. hopped on the train or no, I think I flew, I flew to New York and stayed with the guy, stayed with some guy that, that I had just met at a comic convention who told me about there being advertising departments. And I was like, I don't know. I'm, I've never been in New York. I'm scared of New York. Could I cr crash on your couch? And he was like, to his credit, he was just like, yeah, come on out. Most people just assume I send them a resume and a cover letter and that'll be plenty. But particularly in a creative role, if you're trying to apply for a creative job, coming up with that car, those cards, something indifferent, something off the wall that really gets their attention. I think that's really important. I think you really hit on something there. Oh, for sure. And you have to prove yourself. So like the, even the cards I was sending, one of them, you know, had a shot of Spider-Man and the word balloon was was whited out and it opened up and said, I think we both know what's missing. And Kruger for words, you know, it was like that. And then another one showed I was I had spread across the image all the comic books, you know, that that I had and collected and every business is special. I know all your issues. Jim Kruger copyright. So it was like, it was like, yeah. like, like in each case I was proving to them that, that I was familiar with what they did, you know, that I had the degree, I had the portfolio. I was willing to come to New York for not a lot of money. You know, I think my last one uh, said on the front, I hear you're looking for someone to write copy in your advertising department. And then it opened it up and then handwritten, I wrote copy in your advertising department. Am I hired? How did you make that transition to actually writing from doing, you know, advertising for and promoting the comics to actually writing the comics? Before I had even gotten to Marvel, I started noodling with the idea of, of writing comics. I created a couple IPs, you know, as they are now. And, you know, they're, 
one of them especially is still going and there's hope for another, but I may do that as like a novel instead at one point. Um, but I was playing with the idea and, and I did, I did dummy, I did dummy things like, like Todd McFarlane is, is this, he's the guy who created Spawn, his run on Spider-Man and the Hulk is revered. And so I was really, I was really inspired by this writer of the eighties named Alan Moore. Like his stuff is, is crazy now, but this is the guy who gave us Watchmen, Swamp Thing, wrote probably the greatest Superman stories ever written. Um, and I was into his stuff because part of what he was doing was, was something that as an advertising copywriter, I was doing Yeah. And that was something that Alan Moore did. And I was like, wow, that I never thought I could. Oh, now I want to try. So anyhow, Todd McFarlane, Spider-Man number one. The art was beautiful. The critics didn't like it. They said it was really not very well written and, and that kind of thing. And just, in, in Todd's fairness, this was the first issue he ever wrote. So no one does great the first time. Anyhow, I thought, oh, well, I'll blow these things up to 11 by 17 each page, and then I'll white out everything, and I'll try rewriting it the way I would do it. But where I was bad is I made a copy, and I took it to Todd just in case he wanted a writer. So that's my first comic I ever wrote, giving to the guy who's published, you know, what a, what a dummy. But hey, I was still trying. So they, they so went for it? Was, uh, he didn't go for it, but I went for it. And then I started creating things and started figuring out characters and backlogs. And I would start going to conventions and get artists who I love to do little sketches for me of these characters I had created. And bit by bit, like slowly, like my career has always moved so slowly one thing led to another, which ultimately my first, my first opportunity at Marvel was to go to a convention in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So it was like, I went there to come back here um, and help promote this new project and this new artist that no one had ever heard about before. And that was Alex Ross. Wow. And he and I geeked out over Jack Kirby, going back to some of those first comics my dad gave me, you know, we talked about it. He talked about how his mom made him a costume and we just kind of became friends. And while I was at Marvel, I would promote his stuff. And then there were opportunities where I was working for one of their promo magazines and the idea is they would show alternate designs of characters and I would write an alternate history to it. And Alex loved this. Like the way I wrote it, he was like, Jim, maybe, you know, one day there will be an opportunity to work together. And I think I found it. And it, was, it wasn't a paid gig. It wasn't anything. It was Alex had finished this totally revered graphic novel called Kingdom Come. And a magazine called Wizard Magazine asked him if he would do designs for what the Marvel characters might look like when they're older. And... So he came up with a bunch of designs and said, Jim, why don't you do, you know, what you do for that other thing? Give me an alternate couple paragraphs for each character. And I did it. And that went before the head of Marvel. And then all of a sudden it was a real project. And Alex was like, I don't even know what the story would be. Usually when I do something, I know the story. Like the story a lot of times came from him beforehand. And he's like, I have no idea. And then one night, like, it almost came to me fully formed. Of course, it was after years and years and years of loving these books and loving these stories. It was years and years of living life and stuff like that, but it became fully formed. And I remember calling him and just leaving at least an hour, hour and a half of what this was, what the story could be on his voicemail. And he called me later that night. And our calls were always late at night. And he was like, yeah, it's a real project now. I can't believe it. It's a real project now. Now I know what the story. And he was so complimentary. He was like, Jim, it's hard for me to tell this idea to people and not want to claim it for my own. Like just sweet and kind. And it began like a creative partnership that, that has led to so many things. And what's really interesting is the plot to that story became the central mystery of the Eternals movie that just came out. 
I was going to say, that was a long time ago, but Eternals is just now. So, yeah, tell us about that. Well, what was so funny at the time is um, I met Kevin Feige when Marvel Studios was just begin- beginning because they had been working with Paramount on the, was it the first Hulk and Iron Man movie? Yeah. Iron Man was there too, right? Right. And anyhow, it was the beginning of Marvel Studios. Kevin Feige was there and both Kevin Foggy. Feige and Avi Arad loved Earth X. And then they found Foot Soldiers, which was that creative thing I was working on before I even worked at Marvel. And they were like into that. And, you know, Avi tried, he was like, maybe we could make this a movie, you know, but, but it was like, in so many ways, it was inviting me into a world or through a door that I hadn't yet passed. Like, like there was the door to writing comics and, and I got through there, but the film thing was, was another side of it. And then it was crazy because I was in a back, I was st- like, I was living, I was in New York, but living in Jersey and, um, and I'm in the back of the bus. I see some guy next to me. He's reading an article, industry article. And there's a shot of the new Johnny quest TV series. And I was like, yeah, I don't love the new series, but that old cartoon was so important to me when yeah. I was a kid, blah, blah, blah. And I had like, I always would have some, some comics or something on my lap. And, um, he said, Oh, what's that? And I told him about foot soldiers. And he said, you know what? Me and my partner might be into this project. And I was like, We've we've made movies before, and I was like, "Well, would I know any of your movies?" And it was Michael Uslan, the producer of all the Batman movies. Oh and my here we gosh. are on the eve of another Batman movie with Michael attached, and he was this—he's—he was such a kind, inspiring, patient guy, and he had he optioned it for a couple years, and it was set up at Paramount, but there are all kinds of things going on through Paramount, um, so. So ultimately the option lapsed and he said, you know what? I'm not ready to give this up yet, but I so believe you in a writer. So if you give me a free option for two more years, I'll teach you how to write a screenplay. And so, you know, it didn't go past, he didn't get it past the option and blah, 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 like that. But I got this one-on-one experience of writing with him that then put me on another trajectory. Yeah. I was, you know, I did a, summer's directive intense workshop at nyu and you know came up with a an award-winning short film that they still use to show you what you could do in that little directive well okay for for people that don't really know a lot about the comic world explain a little bit about how it happens you're the writer do you bring the idea to the table do you bring a fully fleshed out story uh how do you work with a with an artist, how, how does the whole thing work? So, I mean, the whole process is pitching and, oh, that's so good to talk about. That's, you know, when, when like being able to pitch is, is like vitally, vitally something you have to learn, like whoever, and, and we become yeah. writers because, oh, we're internal people. And, you know, we think about, oh, you know, especially, especially in Hollywood, but, but even in comics, You have to be able to tell your idea. You have to be able to, almost like you're at a campfire, get someone nervous about your characters, get them excited to see what happens next, get them in in so many ways, the idea of pitching, whether you do it on paper or, you know, verbally, again, it's kind of like advertising and marketing. True. Because, Because you have to be fun. You have to show that if someone buys into this with you, it's going to be fun to work with you. You know, I kind of live by the rule that if people don't want to party with me, they don't want to work with me. Yeah, good they don't rule. Want to party with me, they don't want to hear what I believe or care about or am convinced other people will care about. Like in so yeah. many ways, that's that's vitally important. I once had I once had an agent who I said, Yeah, no, we're working together on this project. I me and this producer. And I think, I think they're becoming a friend. And he's like, Oh, it's not show friends. It's show business. And that's been proved wrong to me over and over and over again. I mean, we have lawyers and we have agents for the show business side, but when it comes to working with people, it's gotta be show friends. 
Yeah. Because it's painful and you can be investing years into something that still doesn't happen. And at least you can have the relationship out of that that could, you know, in a more mercenary way, you know, help you set up another project. But in the most primal, personal way, you have this relationship out of this. You, you have yeah. this friendship. You've gone through the trenches with someone and that's who you want to be. And that's who you want to work with because so much work could be considered in vain. So you did a, you, you, you eventually did a ton of work for Marvel, but you also bridged over to DC. How can you? Do, they're not they're not arch enemies. I thought they, it was one or the other. You could do both. Writers and artists go back and forth, and the DC project got me an Eisner for you know best graphic justice of the year. Yeah, justice. Justice was a New York Times bestseller, right? It was. It was. I can I can put that on my list. Yeah, no, that's dude. great. Eventually, it's like, oh, what's the list? <laughs> you know. Now, I think if I recall, Justice was like twelve episodes, right? Yeah, 12 yeah comics, it was twelve issues, fully painted, a miraculous thing. Like, and and I still, I still get people signing things, and that's kind of the fun thing about comics is, you know, it, it's not a lot, but I love that twenty years after a project came out, I still get a residual every three months. Wow. Like that's, that's not terrible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, what about oddball comics? Have you done some real edgy things off to the side that aren't major brands? Well, and some of them are major brands and some of them are really personal and really um, things that I just had to tell. And, and so a lot of times I try to use new artists um, for two reasons. One, because they're really hungry. They really yeah. want to prove themselves um, and, and two, because a lot of times they're cheaper or they're willing to just take a back end. And, and the idea is like, you know, the fact that the fact that there was Alex Ross there, who, despite a couple like indie comics, like foot soldiers and stuff like that, the fact that he was like, yeah, Jim, we should write this. And based on the story I came up with, he's like, okay, it's a new project. Now I'll commit myself to it. Wow. So when you write a comic that becomes a movie um, or a version of it becomes a movie, do the movie producers ask for your advice? Do they want you your insight on the story? Do they ever come to you or they, they go off and do a completely separate thing? Sometimes I like, like it's always different. It's always a different scenario. Like with Eternals, it was totally that idea. And, and what was awesome about Eternals and so exciting for me is, is that, I was invited to the premiere. I was sitting in the premiere, but had no idea that that story would really be told here. But what's funny is when I first met Kevin Feige years ago, he was like, oh, I love Earth X so much. I wish I could make it a, as a film, but I don't have these characters because they're owned by Sony right now. I don't have this because it's owned by Fox right now. And bit by bit, all those characters have been coming under one roof again. Yeah. But at the time I said, you know what? you could probably do that story with the Eternals. And so where Eternals is all a story of seeds being planted that grow and, you know, ultimately it's the big revelation. Like that seed was planted years and years ago, which, which says that this career, again, it reminds me that this career, it's the long career. And sometimes you think nothing's going to happen for 20 years or something like if it doesn't happen in the next year or two, or it doesn't happen by the time you reach 40, you're done. You know, yeah. so I, what's, what's going on right now in your life? What are you working on right now? Uh, well, like, like everything I'm not allowed to say, but I'm writing a movie right now um, about it's 30, 40 years after Capone and one of the gangsters is still living and it's his unlikely relationship with a young pastor. True story, oh. surprising, you know, in the end I'm doing comics with hebrew brand who's this awesome street well he's 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 got so much art he's doing so much stuff um and so i've written three books with him uh some of which are really really funny i'm working on a on a project with chick-fil-a which may be one of the best comic books i've ever written in my life it's taking such a long time but oh my gosh it's so Good. I've gotten, I've, I've sold some shows, you know, that are wherever they are in the midst of it. And 
Um, That's fantastic. Chick Fil A. Chick Fil A. I even have an old horror screenplay that that I wrote during some dark times when I was really feeling sad, and I wrote this thing. It, it's really funny. That's um, great. And now there's new interest in it. Okay. Let me ask you this. I'm always fascinated with practical stuff. How important is a routine for you when you're creating? Uh, you know, do you work certain times of day? What are your best times of day to work? Um, give me a little insight into how you work creatively. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's so important. I used to write at light at night a lot, but now I don't like to write at night anymore. But I would say that that the one goal I have every day, even though there are meetings sometimes or you have to go to this thing or you're getting notes and so that upsets the routine, um, is I try to make sure that no matter what, I write something, I read something, and I uh, watch something every day. Interesting. No matter what, no matter what, that's the goal. Like like I have my to-do list that I have to go through, but I have to do those three things every single day. I usually- Now do my best writing in the afternoon. Like I get to wherever I go and like from 12 to four or five, I write. That's probably my worst time of day. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a morning guy. Afternoons are for naps. <laughs> so so let, me, let me just repeat three or four things that I've gotten from this conversation so far. And that is that number one, when you were young, you before you ever got the shot, you immersed yourself in the comic world. You went to comic, you know, you went to comic conventions, you knew all the players, you did your homework. I mean, for people out there that are watching or listening that are young or trying to break into some area of the creative world, I think that immersion thing is important. Taking, investing the time your own of your own to just know everything you could possibly know about the world, meet meet as many people as possible, show up and get immersed in that world. I mean, that that seems like a real strategy of yours when you were young. Yeah, and and the other thing is like it wasn't because I wanted to go into the comic industry. It wasn't because like like my problem is that I'm satisfied with little too easily. That's really always been my problem. I'm like kind of like oh if i'm doing advertising if if i get to write a whole campaign about how cows prefer this tea dip and happy cows make happy milk awesome i'll just do that and that'll be fine but but the thing with the comic industry is that i loved it like i loved it like people should look at the things that they love and be like there's nothing wrong with with getting into it and learning about it. And, and, you know, a lot of people yeah. will be like, how do I break into the comic industry? And I kind of did all three, but the three rules that were kind of there before that included, you have to, um, you have to have a friend that gets you in. Okay. And that ultimately turned, t- turned out to be Alex Ross, a superstar, which makes no sense on my behalf at all. And, or number two, you have to work somehow in the industry in a different capacity. And I did that with Marvel Comics, certainly for seven years, going from kind of junior copywriter to creative director. Um, And then the third way is you need to write comics that are being noticed somewhere else, and then a Marvel or a DC or whatever will come before you. And I kind of did that too. So those were the three things. But again, this started with kind of loving it. Kind of like, you know, I, I love going on tow jobs and seeing what comics my dad would get for me. I remember I wasn't allowed to go to the drugstore because of the streets and stuff like that. I remember stealing 75 cents from him or a dollar fifty from his change thing, hoping he wouldn't notice so I could get to the store. Oh, and buy that comic book that I knew he would never get for me because I don't know. He, he would, they would consider it yeah. religious or something. And that issue was Eternals number four by Jack Kirby. <laughs> so that's great. That's the other thing, it's like in the process of writing, hopefully we become aware of our own story. And that even helps us look to the future as to where we should go. That's great. Now, the other thing that I've known for a long time with you is you, you, you're at the, you know, you're at the peak of, of this, this, this world. And yet 
you've never been afraid of talking about your faith. You've never, you know, tried to hide it. You've never been in the closet when it comes to your 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 religious views about things. Um, how did that come about? How did uh, you've been? No, I wouldn't say you know being bold necessarily, but you're certainly not afraid to talk about it. I mean, you're very upfront with people, and you're very conversational about it, and open about your faith. Um, well, see, you know, how did that come about? That's really what it is. Like, like in cases like this, I don't go into what I believe at all because we live in a world that 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 minimizes everyone. That 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 will, will take something I said in an interview like this or a podcast yeah. like this and then define me by five words or seven words. And you know what? It's okay to define a product in seven words in advertising. That's not okay with me. Yeah. And yet in other cases, they're looking for champions. They're looking for people to grab onto. And I'm like, I'm always willing to talk about what I believe. And I usually say, you know what? I'm somewhere between Halloween and Christmas. And that doesn't mean Thanksgiving. So, you know, that's where I am. My faith is so big. What I believe in is so big that a single conversation can't do it justice. That's really, you know, it reminds me a lot of a, I know a, I'm friends with an episodic television director, does TV dramas. Um, and he said, you know, I never talk about my faith on the set. You know, I've got 30, 40, 50 people on the crew. I never talk about my faith, but it's always interesting that when somebody's going through marriage problems or drug problems or having some issue in their life, they always find their way to me. And um, so it is interesting. I think just the way we live our life is the biggest story we could possibly tell. So you've done a brilliant job of that. So last thing, um, if there was one thing you could leave for creative people, one, one last thing you could say that would inspire, maybe encourage creative people out there that, who might be in that valley struggling, uh, what, would you, what would you tell them? Uh, well, you know, I, I already said it, but I would say write something every day, read something every day, watch something every day. All right, that's um, good. Because... Because each of those things, each of those things inspires. Each of those things break us from quote unquote writer's block. Reading something, you know, even, even in the valley though, even in the valley, doing each of those things gets us out of our own story. And I'm like, we have to be aware of our story, but at the same time, we're saved by story. We're brought out of the valley by story. And then the valley becomes a peak in and of itself almost because we're able to draw on something that wasn't there before. That's powerful stuff. Jim, thank you. You've been amazing. You've been awesome. And um, we'll look forward to the uh, biopic. We'll look forward to what's going on in the future and stay in touch and see what happens. And you've been terrific today. And I really appreciate you coming on. I'll tell you, that was a great interview with Jim, and I, I'm so grateful for him, his, his, really his witness in the culture, his leadership. He's just a great character, a great guy, just a super friend, and I just think more people need to understand how people like Jim get to that apex of their career where they're doing so well. He's just an accomplished, accomplished creator, accomplished writer, and I'd, I'd encourage you to go check out his comics, go check out his novels, his film. He, he's done an enormous number of things out there in creative world, and it's certainly worth worth pursuing. And, and remember, if you haven't gotten my book, Maximize Your Influence, I'd encourage you to do it. How to make digital media work for your church, your ministry, and you. If you happen to be involved in communication, uh, particularly for a church or a nonprofit organization, a ministry organization, you need to understand how to maximize the digital world that we live in. This is a reference. And I'll tell you, it, it, sit, get, a, get a copy and send it to your pastor. Get a copy and send it to the CEO of your organization, because that's really who it was written for, leaders, to help them understand how to lead teams, how to understand websites and social media and short films and videos and things like that, it's going to be a real resource for them. So I'd encourage you, help them with their career, help them move to the next level and help them get your organization known in a far bigger way. Get them a copy. I'll look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>